Thank you. Thank you for that. It's lovely to be here, even though it is very hot and there's a storm brewing. <clears throat> it's interesting what Bob was saying. If you've never been in a cool, temperate rainforest, go there one day. Go deep inside the forest, as I've done many times. And it is the most unbelievable, extraordinary experience because there's not much wind, there's hardly any wind. That's why they're often in gullies and places like that. And there is total silence. And you can stand there and you can hear this extraordinary silence. And all around, everything is kind of crazy and mixed up. And yet what we're looking at, even though everything is leaning against one another, this everything, what you're looking at is absolute perfect balance. This is what it's all about. It's something which is ecologically intact. But I'm not going to talk about that. And by the way, if you think that I'm going to be talking about how to make compost or <laughs> how to spread sheep manure or grow carrots, you've got bucklers. <laughs> what I'd like to talk about, and basically what I've called this, it's, I suppose, a portrait of a frustrated artist as a little boy, as a big boy, as a young bloke, as a middle-aged bloke, and as an old geezer. In other words, it's amazing when you look at my life and what I've thought about and what I've hoped to achieve and the frustration of never being able to draw or paint and yet, and yet, I've tried. And I think that I'm like many other little kids. I remember going to bed as a tiny child, three or four, and when they lie there in the darkness, and behind my eyelids, I could see pictures and little visions of the things I'd seen that day. At first, it was just kind of colored lights. I used to watch them. And I think it happens probably to what most of us. But after a while, I started to see the faces of people because little kids will always look at your face. I'd be looking at the faces of people. So as I was lying there as a little tiny boy, in bed, I'd see the faces of people in my mind. And then when I started to open up books and read and look at pictures before I could read, and looked at line drawings, a remarkable thing occurred. I used to see the faces of people as drawings. Right? I could see the lines in their faces, almost as if someone had done them with a pen. And I think most of us probably can do this. And uh, I used to have, in my big family, an auntie, Auntie Lily. She was ferocious. She was about that big and that wide. And she had pebble glasses and she was tough and she had a deep man's voice. And she was so tough that my mother once told me that she, and in fact I used to call her Old Man Lily. Because I'd listened to Paul Robeson in those days singing Old Man River. And, and I'll never forget when my mother was ironing away with a flat iron and suddenly I heard this extraordinary voice coming over our battery wireless. And I said to my mother, who's that? Could we stop to listen? And it was, she said, that's Paul Robeson. She said, he's one of us, Peter. Never forget that. And the person that she admired more than anyone else was Paul Robeson and Eleanor Roosevelt, of all people. She said, they're the greatest people on earth. <laughs> Quite interesting. But one night, I was lying there with my eyes closed, and I saw the face of old man Lily. And I'm looking at it with the pebble glasses and the magnified eyes. And I'm lying there and I thought, oh, I can see the lines, everything. And I jumped out of bed and I found a pencil 
and I drew, I kept looking and drawing it on the wall, newly painted. And that's when I got my first stimulus as an artist because the next morning, my mother came in, saw that and said, smack for a start, which naughty boy has drawn old man Lily on the wall? <laughs> and I knew I was on my way. But you know, when I lived in Manchester, there was nearby, there was a croft. Now, a croft in Lancashire is not the same as a croft in Scotland. A Scottish croft is a small farm often surrounded by a wall. But a Lancashire croft is a piece of waste ground. And in fact, it was often a piece of waste ground near some water where they used to put flax out to dry where they used to make flax cloth. And this piece of cloth nearby, every now and then it used to have very special visitors. Most interesting. And I didn't know until one day there was a knock at the door and I saw two women there dressed in strange clothes with not brown faces and they had these great big metal containers and they said, can we come in? And they had a strange accent. And my mother came to the door and she said, yes, come in. And they were what we call gypsies. They call them travelers these days. And they used to come round to our house whenever they came in the house, just three caravans. And they'd come there, these strange women, and fill those big containers. And I was fascinated by them because they'd go to a field nearby and they'd pick herbs. I remember they used to pick what I've since identified as a form of a killer. And I used to go down to where the three caravans were and just sit there and watch them. And one day I said to them, are you gypsies? And they said, no, we're not. We are Romani people. And in fact, they spoke the language, the Romani language which is very similar, by the way, to Yiddish, as I found out later on. There was a lot of links there. But I used to go down there when I was about six or seven, after school, and watch the gypsies. And they used to play a fiddle, and the women used to dance, and they were extraordinarily clean people. The men and the women used to wash themselves all over twice a day. The men had stripped to the waist and washed themselves, wringing out a kind of a thing and wipe themselves with it and then they'd go behind the screen and do the rest of them. And I used to watch them and they got used to me and one day one of them invited me into the caravan and it was glittering, a beautiful caravan. And the caravans themselves were painted with all these amazing little golden and blue scrolls, these wonderful paintings on them, this lovely design. And, this, and the staff used to be tipped up and the horse, always one horse, per caravan, and I was so amazed. And then one day, I was eight years old, and when in Manchester in, what, 1934-35, they were very, very proud of their public library system. In fact, they boasted that no matter anywhere you lived, there were three libraries within walking distance. It was quite amazing. But you were not allowed to join the library until you were eight years old. And then you got a ticket and you could go to any library. And when I was eight, on April the 1st, yes? <laughs> Anybody else April the 1st here? <laughs> and that was it. And I ran all the way to the library. And it was snowing a bit. It was very cold that April day. And I had snow all the way down the side of my body. And I went in with my ticket and a lady there, a grey-headed lady, said, yes, what do you want? I said, I've got my library ticket and I've come to get a book. And she said, yes, okay. And she took my ticket. Let me see your hands. Go home and wash your hands. <laughs> Look, the background I have, you don't worry about that. I ran all the way home again, washed my hands, and ran all the way back. It was only snow. And she looked at my hands again, now choose a book. And I chose a book by Rudyard Kipling called Just So Stories. And I read it and ran back. 
And she said, no, no, you must come back tomorrow. But one of the books I got was Kenneth Graham's wonderful book about Toad of Toad Hall, The Wind in the Willows. Some of you may have read it. And at school, one day, the teacher said, and this is where I found out about my enormous disability, the teacher said to me and the other children, we now, you've read The Wind in the Willows, we read extracts of it, I want you to do a painting of what you've seen in Wind in the Willows. So immediately, I started to work because I wanted to do that particular chapter where they hired a gypsy caravan and went off on the road. And I remember this caravan and I, I started to draw it, but it wasn't right. And I, I thought, oh, I've wasted a page. I went to another page. And I got it with a little bit of charcoal, and then I started to paint. I painted all the little golden things. And every now and then, I went to the window, and I looked out, and it was a blue sky. And I looked at the sky, and the way it was, and the way the colors changed and faded and became paler towards the horizon. And I did all these things. And then I had to do the three of them sitting around the fire with a pot, as I'd seen the gypsies. And I did that in an awkward kind of a way, and it looked okay. And then the teacher came up behind me and looked and said, Oh dear, dear me, Peter. Oh dear me, what have you done? Oh dear, dear me. Take that to the headmaster. And I took the painting to the headmaster, and he looked at it, and he said, Oh dear me, Peter, what on earth have you done? What on earth have you done? And I said, I just did the painting as I thought I saw it. He said, oh, Peter, he said, there's something wrong with your vision, lad. There's no such thing as a purple sky, right? And I didn't know, I just found out that I was red, green, colorblind. And in fact, I've denied it ever since. You know, I defy it. I mean, that's why I'm wearing this blue shirt. <laughs> but that was my first experience. I'm thinking, I'm trying it out. And it was years later that I remember looking at a painting of the European painter Chagall. And I said, he's one of my mob. Look at those skies. <laughs> right? And I found out there's quite a lot. One man in ten. One man in ten is red, green, colour blind. You know, we're not alone, and don't forget that to be colorblind is not to be blind to color. It's just that you see different colors. It's brilliant. In fact, in the evening, my color vision is normal. It's quite absolutely terrific. I can see, I often say to my wife, look at that amazing camellia. Look at the redness of it. And she says, yes, it's been there all day, Peter. <laughs> But you know, I'm growing up and learning about these things. And then, when I was in the, in the World War II, I was in the British Parachute Regiment. And then we were posted to Europe, right at the very end of the war, when Europe was in ruins. And I'll never forget, and it's a weird story, this, and I must tell you this, because it has some links with what we've seen here tonight. Because we got on a train somewhere in northern England, a whole train load of us, and it was a really strange experience. It was a troop train, it was full. And we were in a carriage there, about six of us sitting there, and suddenly some very fierce looking, two very fierce looking staff sergeants with hard, stern faces came along, opened the door, looked at us, and says, Get out! Get out! Get out! And we had to get out. And they sat there and I said, well, who are these people? And it turns out, someone said, I met a man there. He was a, a mad Irishman. He was an actor and a poet and a writer. And he said, they've come from Lucknow. Now, Lucknow is in India. He said, but they are from the detention barracks there the British Army detention barracks, and they go around in pairs because they're so cruel. And remember that the British Army detention barracks were designed that if men were in the front line 
and they had to get, were sent into detention. They were glad to get back into the line because conditions were so bad and they were so cruel. And we got on a boat at, in um, Dover on a ferry. We were supposed to go to Calais, but we didn't. We went to Dieppe, it took a lot longer. And we were out at sea there, and like this Irishman took a fancy to me. He said, I'll look after you, lad, right? I'll keep an eye on you. And he was telling me all sorts of stories. And he loved Monet. He was telling me about Monet. And I said, what's so good about this painter? He said, he was the first one to see the light. He was the first one, you know? Anyway, we traveled, landed at Dieppe, and, came, and then we were onto a troop train that was traveling through France and Switzerland and part of Germany and Austria to a place called Villach near Klagenfurt. That's where we were heading for. But because it was a troop train and because so many things were happening at the time and it was, the, and it was very, very it was so unimportant, we were shunted backwards and forwards. It took us, I think, three days to get there. But in the meantime, in northern France, we kept stopping. We'd stop all night in some siding. And this is the amazing thing. One day, we stopped at a siding, and the Irishman, by the way, was writing his life story. He'd got about 25 toilet rolls. Yes. And it was British Army skid paper, as we used to call it. And he had them all on string, and he was writing his life story on toilet rolls and furiously writing. And he looked out the wi window when we stopped into this little area, this tiny little hamlet, and it's called Vernon. And he said, this is it. I said, is it Vernon? I said, I've never heard of it. He said, it's, basically it's named after some English people, so that's how you pronounce it, he said. This is where Monet's garden is. This is 1946. Come with me. And we left the train late that afternoon and walked about, probably be about two or three miles less. And that, whether it was what, I don't know, I don't know, but I did see that Japanese bridge, but the whole thing was an absolute wreck. The bridge itself was broken. The whole thing was massively overgrown. And uh, the whole thing was totally neglected. I've never been back since, by the way, but that was my little experience oddly enough, of money. But later on, my work, my art, right, I'm interested in these things, but couldn't do it, you know. And then, one day, I, I was in the Australian Army, I was in the Korean War as a machine gunner. I came back, just wanted to get into the garden. And I became a communist. I became a communist partly because where I lived in Manchester, in the district where I lived, everybody was a socialist. I never met anyone who wasn't until I was about 15 or 16. They all were. You know, uh, my grandfather told me how he once met Frederick Engels, right, who used to have a girlfriend in Ancoats in Manchester. <laughs> That's the only way he knew Engels, right? And, uh, so, the, and so I became a communist. And uh, I might add, it was weird being a communist because you'd think revolution, but they didn't talk about revolution at all. They're the most boring meetings. They talked about fixing the hole in the road next door and wages and hours and conditions and all these things. I'd sit there listening to it. And also the conditions of economic conditions in Timbuktu, you know. It was weird, totally out of touch. One day, I got a call from the secretary and he said, will you stand as a candidate for the Communist Party? And I thought, oh, I didn't really want to. So I said, yes, oh yeah, I'll be in it. So I stood as a senator, right? I, I created the most remarkable electoral, it was a record in a way. I actually achieved, I was number three on the ticket, I actually, the lowest vote that's ever been recorded in parliamentary elections, <laughs> ever. I might add, I was so loyal, because I was number three, I didn't give myself number one either, I put number three for myself. 
So I was never very good for politics. But one day, a, a man turned up. And he turned up on a motorbike, and he was almost totally inarticulate. What I didn't know, he was a brilliant artist. Absolutely extraordinary. And he said, I've just come to look at you. And he stood there staring at me. And he said, that's what for? He said, I just want to see anyone that's silly enough to stand as a communist, right? And he said, and I'm one, you know. But he said, I can't believe it. He said, that why you've done it? I said, well, because they asked me, that's all. But what this man did, he painted. And he was fascinated by light, fascinated by Japanese painters, fascinated by the Chinese and the way they use the light. And he told me something that I never knew. If anybody's ever been to Launceston, they've got a beautiful gorge there called the Cataract Gorge. But whenever you go down there, it's very hard to photograph because it's almost partly in shade because of the way it's situated. Well, he was the one who discovered that at, on Midsummer's Day, at about half past four in the morning, it's the only time in the year when the sun shines right the way down the Cataract Gorge. And he said, you can see under the trees. And you can see all these amazing things. But the, he was a very good artist. But whenever he'd finished a work of art, he then used to take them all outside and burn them. And I said, why do you do that? And he said, because I don't want to ever have people... And I said, why don't you hang them up and let people see them? He said, I don't want people to look at my guts hanging on the wall. Right? He said, it took me too much out of it. And I've done what I wanted to do. But one day, somebody got one of his paintings. And it was a remarkable painting of a village, uh, a construction village. Uh, what they call a hydro village. And it was quite stark. It was a series of these workers' huts with telegraph poles lying higgledy-piggledy and, big, and there was 44-gallon drums lying all over the place and in the background was a running figure. It was extraordinarily dramatic and this friend of mine had got it and I don't know how. And one day the friend said to me, I'm going to England, would you mind looking after this painting for me? So I hung it on the wall. I used to look at it and one day the artist came in and he looked, he said, how on earth did you get a hold of that? And I said, it belongs to so-and-so. And he said, well, well, well. He said, I should have burnt it. I said, why? He said, well, I've done it. He said, I was just studying then on those days. I was trying to find out about perspective and particularly with tubular things and circular things, right? And tubes and all that sort of thing. He said, I was trying to do it and I've done it now, right? I'm on to something else now. And so, I'm learning. He said, you're the sort of person, he said, I'm looking at you and your version of what you think is art. He said, the return of the prodigal son. He said, that's about your limit, you know. <laughs> I was no, not really. And then, I never really thought much about it until later on, I decided I'd be an art critic. I thought, if I can't do it, I might as well be a critic. Now, it was not because I suddenly got the inspiration or that I'd been yearning to be an art critic. It was not like that at all. I'd been making television programs for a while. And not many people know, and you should know, that with the Garden Australia television program, it's up to 15 or even 20% of the viewers are kids. Because the mother says to them, you sit there and watch telly while I get the tea ready. And they're looking at this bloke here, this demented garden gnome, bouncing around all over the place and getting all dirty and not getting into trouble. The kids loved it. And I'd get all these letters from little kids. But what they did was to send me all their paintings. I got all these paintings used to wrap and I'd try and answer them, but there were so many. And then one day, a painting arrived which was absolutely extraordinary. I couldn't believe it. I looked at it and I said to the others in the crew, what do you think of that? Isn't that amazing? Because what it was, wasn't a painting of me in the garden, as most of them did. It was nothing more than three huts with conical roofs, with bright orange roofs, 
and green walls. And it was surrealism. And in the background, they were on, sitting on kind of really purple-blue clay. Extraordinary. And in the background was an overcast, dark brown sky. And it was so amazing, these three huts. I mean, that was all. And it was signed, um, her name was Kate Buck, B-U-C-K, age six. And she said, here is my painting for you, Peter, she said. And she had a address in Perth, just a district in Perth, right? And that was all. And I put it on the wall and I was fascinated by it. And I thought, at last I've discovered the secret of abstract surrealist art and that's it, I'm going to be an art critic. That's what's there. And one day I thought, look, I've got to do something about this. And I thought, I'll try and find this little girl and thank her. So I rang up what was then Telecom, and I said, look, I want to know the address of somebody named Buck, Kate Buck, in this district in Perth in Western Australia. And the woman said, we're not allowed to give the addresses out of people, I'm sorry. However, I've got a problem with my lemon tree. And if you can help me, you never know. So we fixed the problem, and she gave me the address and the telephone number. And I rang that number, and this is amazing. And a woman answered with a sharp voice. Hello, hello, she said. Oh, I said, look, my name is Peter Condol, I'm from Tasmania. I wonder if Kate Buck, does she live there? Who are you? What do you mean? I'm sorry, I don't even know you. What do you want to speak to her? I said, well, she wrote to me. No, she didn't. I said, well, she wrote to me and sent me a painting. No, she did not. She doesn't know you. Who are you? Why, why are you ringing like this? I'm sorry, you, we don't know you. We don't want to know you. And I said, well, I've got her painting here in front of me. I said, I can see it, and I've got it on the wall, and she sent it to me. She said, what's your name? I said, Peter Condor. She said, oh, my God. Kate, quick. It's him. <laughs> and this little voice came on the phone and said, hello. You know that amazing, precise way that six-year-old girls talk? Very deliberate. And I said, look, Kate, I'd just like to thank you for that amazing painting you've sent me. I've got it on the wall. I said, I've never seen anything like it. It's so original and so different than anything I've ever seen of these three little huts with the conical roofs, that bright orange, and the green walls, and that peculiar clay. I said, it's just so beautiful, and I'd just like to thank you for it. And she said, oh, well, well, actually, well, she said, you've got it upside down, it's three organic carrots. <laughs> which it was. <laughs> and that's when I gave up my ambitions to be an art critic. <laughs> and decided to stick to gardening. And rather than paint carrots, plant them, you see, and cabbages and cauliflowers and things like that. So this is my story of my life. And yet, even though I'm an old geezer, isn't it funny? Even today, I mean, I'm looking at your faces here, and you'll be pleased or horrified to know that when I go to sleep tonight, just before I go to sleep, <laughs> I'll be looking at your faces, and there'll be line drawings, and some of them will have their mouths open and fast asleep. <laughs> yes, I've got you. <laughs> and that's the story, basically, of a frustrated artist as a young man Thank you very much for coming.